Hello, Mark here from Present Day Production again, and welcome to the penultimate video in our series on acoustics, where we discuss how you can get your monitoring environment as good as it can possibly be. In this video, we'll look at various types of acoustic panel you can buy and both make yourself. And in the next episode, we'll answer some of your questions from the comments, as well as having a good roundup of the key points from the whole series, and also having a look at some of the photos um, who some of our Discord members have shared with us, and coming up with a few suggestions on how maybe those setups can be improved. So if you want to join us in the chat on Discord, it's completely free and the link is in the description below. And don't forget that also, if you want me to master your music, you can get 50% off using the promo code YouTube. Just visit our website. Again, all the links in the description below. I've had some really awesome music through from a lot of you over the past few weeks which has been great to hear. Um, I've also had one or two pretty awful mixes as well, but that's good. If your mix isn't up to scratch, I don't wanna just take your money, slap a limiter on it and run for the hills. I'll get in touch and we'll discuss ways in which you can improve things. So don't be shy. It's about working together and helping you get the best from your music. So get in touch at whatever level you think you're at and let's work together to get the very best out of your mixes. So acoustic panels, what are they? What do they do and what are we aiming for? Well, firstly, this can get very technical very quickly and I don't want to do that. There's plenty of technical information out there and if you wanna geek out with expensive measurement microphones and RT60 calculations, then these videos on this channel aren't for you. They are hopefully practical videos on simple things you can do with no technical knowledge to often hear a vast improvement in your monitoring environment and therefore create better sounding music. And don't forget that monitoring is everything. If you've got 30,000 quids worth of outboard gear, summing mixers, boutique mic preamps, but you're monitoring on budget near fields, then selling the lot and spending that money on better monitors and your room acoustics will make far more of a difference to your music in the modern age than having all that gear feel free to roast me in the comments if you disagree. So before we discuss acoustic panels, let's have a look at the two types of acoustic energy we need to control in a good listening environment, velocity and sound pressure. In a very oversimplified nutshell, velocity-based energy is the movement of air molecules and pressure is just that, pressure, and we need to trap some of that energy. Broadly speaking, velocity traps are best at absorbing mid and high frequencies, but because their effectiveness is based entirely on the length of the waveform, we need very deep traps to be effective down to lower frequencies, and that's where pressure traps come in. Pressure traps only work at the lower bass frequencies and they are also more frequency specific as they need to be tuned and inherently they have a fairly narrow Q or frequency range that they cover. So in an ideal world, we want to combine velocity traps with pressure traps to get a good broadband treatment in the room. But velocity and pressure, an analogy please Mark. Okay, well imagine the audio coming from our speakers is a drone which can only fly in a straight line. Let's imagine the lighter, smaller parts of the drone, the propellers and their shields, as our high frequency energy, and the camera and its gimbal as our mid-range, and the body and battery pack as our base energy. Now imagine that drone flying through tree canopies in a forest. The leaves are gonna be acting as velocity traps and breaking off the lighter parts of the drone as it flies through them. The finer branches will be doing the same and breaking off a bit more, extending down into our camera or mid-range, but they're gonna to struggle to stop the base energy, the heavy body and battery pack. The most effective way to stop these is by using pressure. In this case, a large tree trunk the drone will slam into. In our room, we're faced with a similar situation. Our audio in the mid and high frequencies is relatively easy to get under control with standard velocity traps, but our base energy is much harder to stop. We're gonna need some tree trunks and they're going to need to be in just the right places. So what are velocity traps and pressure traps and how do they work? Velocity traps are simply absorbent materials such as acoustic foam or better still acoustic insulation such as rock wool or rigid fiberglass. The thicker the material, the lower the frequency it will be effective down to, and that's essentially it. 
They tend to come in a frame for support and be covered with acoustically transparent fabric to make them look nice and keep any stray fibres in. And they're all based on the same principles. They're very easy and cheap to make yourself and work by turning acoustic energy into tiny amounts of heat, generated by friction as the moving air molecules try to pass through them. Pressure traps on the other hand work in a very different way and need to be tuned to trap specific frequencies and be placed in areas of high pressure in the room. That's typically at the boundaries and often in corners. There are two main types, membrane traps and Helmholtz resonators. Membrane traps work a bit like a drum in reverse. The equivalent of the drum shell is an airtight box and the depth and size of that box determine the frequency they work at. And the equivalent of the drum skin is the membrane fitted to the front of the box that vibrates in sympathy with that frequency with the air in the sealed enclosure behind it acting as a spring to remove that resonance and convert the energy. Membranes are typically made of heavy mass loaded vinyl, sheet material such as plywood or even sheet steel or aluminium. There aren't so many videos on YouTube showing how to build membrane style absorbers and that's because they are very, very difficult to get right. They need precise engineering and there are many factors that come into play when building them. What the membrane is made of, thicker, heavier material will resonate differently to thinner, lighter material. How tightly is it stretched over or a to the front of the box behind it, how airtight is the box, etc. etc. And if you do get it right, need to trap say 50 hertz and get your box trapping 50 hertz, you'll need at least four or five, and they have to be positioned in the room where the pressure levels build up or they won't do anything at all. And Sod's Law dictates that that position is going to be right in front of the door or where the built in cupboards are or right where you need to put your monitors. Helmholtz resonators are effectively a tuned ported speaker enclosure in reverse, a suitably sized box with a hole in. And the most common analogy for those is that when you blow over a bottle, the bottle will resonate at different frequencies depending on how big it is, the size of the hole and whether or not there's any liquid in it and you'll hear a note. Helmholtz resonators work in the same way. And guess what? They're just as difficult as membrane traps to get right. I've experimented with building both membrane traps and resonators in the past, and my DIY skills are okay, I've built this studio, but I've never actually managed to get one right. And as with room and studio design, you never really know how effective it's going to be until you try it. And with pressure traps operating at such a narrow frequency range, if you're 10 to 20% off, which you more than likely will be, you're going to be making the room response worse and more skewed in the low end. You also need to perform accurate acoustic measurements with a professional measurement microphone and suitable software. And this is a skill set in its own right. The theory of both measuring the acoustic response of a room and building pressure traps to control the low end tends to get vastly oversimplified. And in practice, both are very, very difficult to get right. And that's why we spent so much time in a previous video in this series on getting ourselves and our monitors in the optimal place for low end control, the place in the room with the flattest response and the shortest, most even reverberation time. And that's also why we used the best measurement microphones we have and the ones specifically tailored to us as individuals, the ones on the side of our head. So my advice would be that if you're going the DIY route, stick with standard velocity style absorbers, which are both cheap and easy to make and relatively cheap to buy if you can't make them. And then if you think you still have a particular frequency either cancelling out in the low end or greatly amplifying itself, you can test for this by simply loading a test tone generator on your DAW and sweeping very slowly through the low end at your listening position from 20 hertz up to 250, 300 or so. You will hear any peaks and troughs, assuming your monitors go low enough to reproduce those frequencies. And once you've found an issue, say at 70 hertz at your listening position, then walk around the edge of the room because sound pressure builds up at the boundaries and make a note of the places along those boundaries, along the walls, where those buildups are at their worst. And that could be in the corners. It Just make a note of, of where it really builds up. Then see if you can practically put some traps there. And if you can, go to someone like GIK Acoustics who offer both very reasonably priced off the shelf, precisely engineered tune solutions, and will also make custom traps specific to any frequencies you may be having problems with as well. But let's go back to velocity traps and look at where you should put them and how we can double their effectiveness for free. Firstly, the most important thing, don't use cheap foam. 
Velocity traps are really only effective at a quarter wavelength when placed on the wall, which means that two inch thick foam stuck to the wall will only be effective down to 1700 Hertz, 1700 Hertz, which will leave your room sounding boxy and awful. If you can build or buy proper six inch deep panels, they will be effective down to around 600 Hertz and we can double their effectiveness or make them work down to around 300 Hertz, giving us an extra octave of effective treatment for free by spacing them a further six inches off of the wall. This means they also act as pressure traps on the room boundaries and so many people don't do this. Adding an air gap behind your panels, even a couple of inches can make the world of difference. So try to incorporate that in your room design when planning things out. If you're in rented accommodation and can't go fixing panels to the wall, then simply mount them on stands, again spaced from the wall a little. These can easily be constructed out of wood and then your panels can double as movable gobos when recording. It also makes experimentation a lot easier when it comes to placement within the room. So where should you start when placing velocity traps? Well, my advice and the advice of many would be to start with your first reflection points. This means placing panels on the side Side walls and ideally on the ceiling as well. You can easily find your first reflection points by sitting in your listening position and asking someone to hold a small mirror at head height and running it down the length of the side walls. When you can see your speakers in the mirror, that is where you want to place your first panels. The same goes for the ceiling and you can space the panels off of the ceiling by suspending them on short chains or hooks. Once you've done this and your first handful of panels are up, then you can perform some listening tests and hear how things sound in the room. You might find you're hearing some reflections from the wall in front, which is colouring your mid-range and high-end detail, as we found here when we had a big TV on the wall behind the speakers. And if so, then this is another perfect spot to play some more velocity absorbent panels. Similarly, you might be getting some reflections from the back wall. If your room is large enough and you don't want the room to sound too dead, then you could think about adding some diffusion here, but this is really only effective in a large enough room. Ideally, you need to be at least three meters away from the diffusion for it to have any effect. So if in doubt, then go for more absorption. If your DIY skills aren't up to scratch, then you can buy very effective non-foam based acoustic panels from a number of different manufacturers. Now, I can only really recommend those that I've heard in action and used myself, and those from GIK Acoustics are excellent. Equally excellent are Ethan Weiner's Real Traps. Both are basically fabric covered rigid fiberglass, so don't be afraid to go the DIY route if your skills are up to it, and getting the most bang for your buck is a prime consideration. But even adding a few panels from GIK or real traps can make a huge difference to not only the sound but also the look of the room and that is an important consideration walking into a professional looking environment rather than one with saggy dirty stained duvets hanging up on the wall can make a big difference to your creativity if you have any questions we'll be answering those in the next video so please leave those in the comments below and once again you can join us on discord for free if you want to join in the healthy chat on there and you can also post photos of your room for feedback as well as always thanks for watching check out the other videos in this series if you haven't already please subscribe and ding the ding dong if you'd like to be notified of future videos and you'll see us in the next one